Hunger is a fundamental drive, since it keeps us alive. If we weren't motivated to eat, we'd die after about a week or so. But our relationship with hunger, feeding, and food is quite complex. Even though, from a biological point of view, food is just fuel to keep our bodies working, we don't treat food as a simple energy source. For example, some or even all of these foods might look irresistible to you, or you might be the rare person who doesn't like popcorn, pizza, or pancakes. So you might choose not to eat these foods if offered. Maybe you love pizza, but hate black olives. But what if you were really, really, really hungry? Would you eat whatever food is available, even black olives? What influences your decision? It turns out that there are two main types of influences on hunger. The first is biology, which is all about meeting energy requirements. The second main influence is psychology, which concerns how our experiences, memory, expectations, and thoughts control the types and amounts of foods we eat. We'll start first with biological influences. So where are the hunger control centers? Well, one sensible starting place is the stomach, which is hard to see in this illustration with the rest of the internal organs in the way, but it's located here. If you don't eat for a period of time, you might notice your stomach growling. Is that a necessary part of the hunger response? The short answer is no, not really. But let's look at some of the evidence that supports this conclusion. There are sensory nerves that allow the stomach to communicate with the brain. So it seems possible that these might be responsible for signaling when the stomach is empty. However, if these nerves are cut surgically, individuals still feel hungry and full. Some other evidence comes from research on people who have undergone gastric bypass, where the majority of the stomach is removed. And these individuals still have feelings of hunger. Things circulating in the bloodstream are important signals to our energy status. We absorb three main types of energy sources from the foods we eat, fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Carbs are a readily available source of food energy since they can be broken down fairly easily into simple sugars. One bloodborne substance that appears to be important in hunger is glucose. When we go without food for a long period of time, our blood glucose levels drop, and this is detected by special areas in the brain involved in hunger. The hypothalamus, which is located right about here in a human brain, has an important role in controlling hunger. Since hunger is very similar in humans and other animals, a lot of what we know about the hypothalamus and feeding is from studies with rats. The hypothalamus is located roughly here. In real life, a rat brain looks like this from the side view. But if we flip the brain so that we're looking up at it from underneath, the hypothalamus is located in this region. If we were to take a section through this part of the brain and lay it flat so we can see the structures inside, it looks like this. The hypothalamus is down here, at the bottom of the brain. This darkly colored region is a collection of neurons that make up the ventromedial hypothalamus, which reduces feeding by promoting feelings of satiety, in other words, feeling full. This part of the brain stimulates the sympathetic nervous system responsible for fight or flight functions, and destruction of this area leads to overeating and weight gain. The region here at the sides is called the lateral hypothalamus, and it's involved in promoting feeding. When this area is stimulated, animals immediately feed, even if they've already eaten. It turns out that there are a bunch of chemical messengers involved in hunger and satiety. These all communicate, usually directly, with the hypothalamic areas just described. Neuropeptide Y is one of the most potent appetite stimulators ever discovered. Since if it's introduced into the brain of a lab rat, it will immediately eat, even if it had just eaten a meal. Orexin, ghrelin, melanin, and the endocannabinoids, which bind to the same receptors as marijuana, are all appetite stimulators that promote feeding. On the other hand, there are also a ton of chemical messengers that reduce feeding. Insulin, which is released when we eat carbohydrates, acts on the hypothalamus to inhibit feeding. Leptin, released from fat cells, also acts on the hypothalamus to reduce food intake. Peptide YY, 
and cholestocinin, known by its abbreviation CCK, are chemical messengers released from the gut organs in response to food intake, and they reduce feeding as well. So clearly there are a lot of checks and balances on feelings of hunger and satiety, so it makes you wonder why anyone would over or under eat. There must be something more to this story. Even though our biology is wired for us to eat when we require energy and stop when we have enough, our experiences have a huge effect on feeding. So let's look at some of the psychological influences on feeding. Here's a quick test. Which would you prefer to eat? A banana from the bunch on the left or the right? Most people will choose the nice, clean, yellow bananas. Why? They look much fresher and probably taste better. The bananas on the right are probably soft and squishy. However, all of these bananas shown here are perfectly fine to eat. I know because I ate them. However, we have a bias to fresh looking foods. It's not an accident that we eat very few blue colored foods, since moldy food is often blue. Let's return to some of the foods I showed earlier. Do these appeal to you more than these? How hungry would you have to be to eat raw oysters? What about Brussels sprouts? Black licorice? These are amongst the top 25 most hated foods, according to a quick search on Google. What is it about these foods that turns people off? They all have nutritional value, so can fulfill biological needs for energy. Is it because they're unusual? Or do they actually taste bad? A huge factor in food preference is prior exposure in our family or culture, and it has an enormous impact on what we choose to eat. As Pavlov's research on learning showed, signals outside the body can have a strong impact on the digestive system. He taught dogs to drool in response to a bell by pairing the sound of the bell with meat, which dogs instinctively drool for. Cues associated with food through classical conditioning can trigger hunger in people too. If you habitually check the time to see when to break for lunch, as millions of people do every day, the clock face showing that it's lunchtime becomes like Pavlov's bell. It becomes a predictor of food availability and triggers feelings of hunger. Using external cues to tell us when we're full can be problematic, since internal cues are much better indicators of energy need. How do you know when you're hungry or full? Do you listen to your body or look at your plate? The finish your plate rule is certainly a good idea to prevent food wastage, but some believe that it might promote overeating and obesity. Research by Brian Wansink's laboratory suggests that we become so used to using external cues that we ignore our internal signals. In other words, we eat with our eyes, not with our stomachs. Wansink did a clever experiment where he gave two groups of participants a bowl of tomato soup and told them to enjoy as much as they wanted. Half of the participants ate from a special refilling bowl, which was connected to a heated container of soup hidden from view. So their eyes were tricked into thinking they were eating a normal bowl of soup. Afterwards, both groups gave very similar estimates on how much they thought they ate, but when this was compared to how much they actually ate, those in the refilling soup group consumed much more than the controls. Therefore, hunger is controlled by both biological and psychological factors. Although our digestive and nervous systems give us plenty of signals about when we should eat and when we should stop, our personal histories and experiences can override these signals. The interplay between biology and psychology are a huge part of maintaining energy needs and body weight.